Have you ever played a game and you loved it so much? Now, I'm not talking about just finishing a game and realizing you had so much fun with it, and now you move on to the next thing on your backlog. I'm talking about you finish a game, and then you sit there, not knowing what to do next. Because the game has done something to you internally that you're reflecting on every single decision, every single story element, every single gameplay choice, that you just sit there and go, wow, I can't believe this is over. I can't believe I got to experience something this great. And that you can't wait to see if the company would one day make a sequel. To then only realize that the sequel is nowhere as great as the first game, so let's just forget about it. About two years ago, I made a video on my channel called Why I Like Life is Strange, and I talked about my love for the game with all its cringy dialogue. So you all shouldn't be surprised that Don't Nod, the same company that created the first Life is Strange, came out with a sequel called Life is Strange 2. Except this time, we are introduced to a new protagonist named Sean, who, after the death of his father and on the run from the cops, has to take care of his younger brother Daniel who just so happens to have superpowers. Now, as much as I hold the first Life is Strange on such a high pedestal, I have to say when it comes to the second game in the series, it doesn't come remotely close. The game's not bad, and my reason for not liking it thankfully has nothing to do with the change of characters, especially since that's the reason why this game got a lot of backlash when it first came out. I actually really enjoy Sean as a character, and love seeing his growth throughout the story. However, when it comes to Daniel... Daniel, dude, do you have to do this every week? Adults only. Oh, whatever. I work too. Yes, I know. But we have to keep a low profile. Got it? For the millionth time. Just wait here for a few minutes. And don't do anything. Nothing. I won't. I swear. Okay. Get in here, you little asshole! What the fuck? Don't touch me, jerk! Don't move! Now explain! That sneaky fucker! He was snooping around your living room! No, I wasn't! I was just bored, so I came in! Oh, Joseph, just teach him a lesson. Come on, man. Big Joe, what are you gonna do? He's just a little fucking kid! This ain't your business. Think I like it. It's mine. <laughs> Ow! What the... Uh. Uh. Okay. Okay, who did that? Uh, I did. My fault. Uh, look! You could say I'm not his biggest fan. I'll be honest, I'm not one to care about the older sibling trying to protect their younger sibling trope, unless it's done right, and the way it's done in this game just makes me want to throw my controller, especially with episode 4. Well, with that being said, let me tell you why I wished I liked Life is Strange 2. Sean Diaz is a 16-year-old boy who lives with his father and younger brother Daniel. Sean is just your average 16-year-old, he has a best friend named Lila who's trying to help him score with a girl he likes, and also happens to be a very talented artist. Sean finds Daniel annoying because his brother is always trying to hang out with him and his friends, and their father is just trying to make Sean understand that Daniel is just 9 years old, and that he doesn't know better. It's a couple of days before Halloween, and while Daniel is outside trying to show off his custom-made zombie costume, accidentally sprays their very racist neighbor with fake blood. Their neighbor then grabs Daniel, which causes Sean to run outside and get into a fight with their neighbor. The neighbor then accidentally slips and hits his head on a rock, and as this is happening, a police officer shows up, demanding for Sean and Daniel to get down on the ground. The Diaz boys plead to the officer and let him know that this is a misunderstanding and that their neighbor was the one who started the fight. Their father runs out trying his best to calm the officer down, but the officer pulls the trigger and shoots their father. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Sean's 
Sean awakes to see that their front yard is in shambles, with the police officer and Sean's father dead. Sean quickly picks up a passed out Daniel, grabs his bag, and runs. Sean and Daniel are now out on the run. Before I move on, let's take a second and analyze what just happened to the Diaz brothers. The first Life is Strange game, though, may appear to be some goofy mystery decision-making game, but when you get to the core of the game, you realize the heavy topics that the game brings up, like Kate's attempt with suicide and the fact that she was drugged and people had their way with her at the Vortex party, or how Rachel was kidnapped, drugged, and was forced to be put in sexual positions and have her photo taken. This isn't just your normal decision-making game. This game brings up real topics and real events that have happened to people, and well, the same could be said here for Life is Strange too. Sean and Daniel are both Latino boys, and unfortunately, because of what they look like, they unfortunately come across people who judge them. After the brothers are on the run for a couple of days, they come across a gas station where Sean decides to get some food. Now, you do have the option here to either pay for some of the food or just steal it. However, regardless of what you do when you go outside to eat said food, the owner of the gas station will come out and accuse Sean of stealing the food and demand he show them proof of paying for it. You once again are given the option to either run, try to talk to the guy, or start a fight. But again, it doesn't matter, because the owner will punch Sean in the stomach and is knocked out. When Sean comes to, the man tells him that he is aware who Sean is, and that people like him are the reason why a wall needs to be built. Life is Strange 2 heavily focuses on racism, especially at a time in America where sadly like people like Sean and Daniel were being targeted based solely on the color of their skin and where their family had come from. And this interaction sadly won't be the last time something like this happens to them. This is something that I always appreciated when the game came out. Willing to talk about topics that obviously aren't easy to have. But that doesn't mean we as people should be turning a blind eye to them. If these topics make you uncomfortable, then good, they're supposed to. Topics like this exist in video games to help us understand and make us feel what people like Sean and Daniel are going through. Even when they're simply just going to a gas station to buy some food. So, funny story about when I was making my first Life is Strange video, at least once a week I happened to listen to a song from the soundtrack, and after that video a couple of my friends watched it, and they also got really into the music. But the music was really the entire point of why I wanted to make that video in the first place. The music just fit, and I was just able to bring this vibe that sometimes said, just stay a while, relax, and enjoy the music. Now, you're probably asking, okay, what about Life is Strange 2's music? What does that bring? Honestly, if you were to ask me this question when I first played the original game back in 2018, I would tell you that the music was terrible. It was nothing like the first Life is Strange. There's no songs that stuck out to me. The moments when Max would just sit and enjoy the environment around her are not the same in Life is Strange 2. But if you were to ask me that question now, I would tell my younger self, yeah, no shit, idiot, that's the point. You see, when Max takes those moments to sit and enjoy the moment around her, or those moments at the end of each episode where a song plays, usually related to a sense of mystery or discovery. So the songs tend to match those moments. But for Sean, when he's able to have those moments to just sit and catch his breath, they're usually followed by dread, paranoia, anxiety, and worry. Sean's story is nothing like Max's story. This is a story about two young boys who have to grow up too fast to take on responsibility that no 17-year-old should be taking, to become a parent at such a young age and put the safety of your brother in front of yours. Like the song I Found a Way by The First Aid Kit that plays at the end of episode two. The brothers have left for once in a long time, a sense of security, a family, and a new friend. 
only to be back on the road with the cops on their tail. Or the song Natalie by Milk and Bones. That plays at the end of episode three after Daniel used his power and accidentally ended up hurting Sean, causing him to lose his eye and be taken away. The game tends to use a lot of lighthearted soundtracks during flashback moments for Sean, like on Melancholy Hill by the Gorillas. Up on Melancholy Hill there's a plastic tree. Are you here with me? Just look at or D A N C E by Justice. In the original Life is Strange, the moments where Max sits down and reflects are called a moment of calm. And each segment has its own soundtrack that, well, makes you and the character feel calm and relax and catches you up to speed on what the character is going through. However, these moments are much different for Sean. They're still called a moment of calm, but though Sean's perspective feels anything but calm, Sean uses these moments a lot of the time to reflect on what's the next plan. How is he going to keep Daniel safe? What happens if they're caught? Will they make it to Puerto Lobos? Who can he trust? Or is this really worth taking the risk? Calling this a moment of calm feels almost like a slap in the face for Sean. But the music does a fantastic job at doing that. Now let's talk about marketing. In June of 2018, Don't Nod released a trailer called The Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit. This short game that's about a nine-year-old boy named Chris who has a wild and big imagination and also happens to be very into superheroes. Chris lives with his father and it's basically implied throughout the game that his father is an alcoholic and tends to hurt Chris during his drunken rages. You see, before Life is Strange 2 came out, this was the first sneak peek without Don't Nod outright saying, hey, this is our next big Life is Strange game, so you should totally play it. Throughout the episode, there are times where it seems like Chris has some sort of superpowers, but then something silly will happen to counteract it. Like Chris trying to use his powers to turn the TV on, but he just has the remote behind his back. Or one of his toys moving on its own, but it's just Chris moving it. Now, at the end of the episode, Chris's dad drank too much, and when Chris tries to wake him, it causes his dad to go into a drunken rage, and he ends up blaming Chris for the death of his mother, since the day she was taking the car out to go pick up Chris, which led her to being the victim of a hit and run. Chris then runs out of the house and goes to climb into his treehouse when one of the wooden steps breaks. But just as Chris is about to hit the ground, he suddenly is able to levitate. When Chris gets back up and looks into the neighbor's yard, he sees it's Sean and Daniel. Daniel and Chris wave at each other, and that's where the episode ends. Now, we were all to believe that Chris was going to be the main character of the next Life is Strange game, until September of 2018, when we got to see the official trailer and see that the two boys would be our main protagonists. But this left the question of, what was the point of playing the awesome adventures of Captain Spirit? And I'm here to tell you that it meant absolutely nothing. All right, maybe not that much, but by episode two, uh, Daniel and Sean go to see their grandparents where they end up staying with them. And a week in is when the events of Captain Spirit take place. Sean and Daniel try to play it off that Chris has powers and now making Daniel and Chris friends. Depending on your actions with Daniel, Sean can tell Daniel he needs to tell Chris the truth or else he'll get hurt. Eventually, rumors spread that their grandparents are hiding the brothers, and they have to leave town. Now, if Daniel told Chris the truth, then Chris will give Daniel his cape and will help the brothers escape. However, if Daniel 
doesn't let Chris know that he doesn't have powers. When the cops show up, they'll try to chase the brothers with their car, and Chris will jump right in front of the car. And there is a chance he could get hit. Or Daniel could use his powers to save him. The entire point of Chris's character is to be a friend for Daniel. For Daniel to meet someone who has just as wild an imagination as him. And to give the boys some peace and act like a normal kid. Just for that to be taken away once again. All right. Let's talk about the biggest negative this game has. And just like every Life is Strange game, it usually has to do with one specific character. And that character is... Daniel. Now I know what's the first thing you're going to say. Nora, he's just nine years old. Of course there's times where he's going to be annoying. I know. I know. Just hear me out. For the first two episodes of Life is Strange, I really tried my best to look past any of the annoying parts of Daniel. And did my best in my playthrough to encourage him and his powers when they were necessary. However, episodes three and four changed everything about that. I could not stand the way Daniel treated Sean in episode three. It didn't matter how much Sean sat down and talked to Daniel about working so much and trying to get more money for them so they could make it to Puerto Lobos safely. It didn't matter to Daniel that Sean wanted to hang out with people his age, even though in the episode prior to that, that was Daniel's entire argument to Sean about wanting to hang out with Chris, and Sean let him. It didn't matter to Daniel that Sean might have finally found someone he could love and open up to because to Daniel, she was taking his brother away from him, and what does Sean get for that? The loss of his eye the loss of all the money he had worked so hard to save up and only to just end up in a hospital where he was almost arrested and taken to jail and don't get me started on the weed farm. So Sean is able to meet up with a group of people that he met back in Beaver Creek where his grandparents are from. One is a girl named Cassidy and another is a guy named Finn. Cassidy and Finn help Sean and Daniel get a job at an illegal weed farm so that they could save money. On payday, their boss, Meryl, asks for Sean, Finn, Cassidy, and their other friend, Jacob, to come inside. But Daniel has to stay outside. Just as Sean is about to get a little extra money for a great job he did, one of Meryl's men finds Daniel sneaking around. And because of this, Sean and his friends don't get paid, and Sean and Daniel are now fired. All because Daniel was bored and didn't want to stay outside. So they once again have to leave. Do you understand why this character can just be so infuriating? I honestly don't think I've ever seen a character this infuriating in a long time. The only other child in a video game that probably pissed me off this much was Sarah from The Walking Dead game season two. And that was mostly because she was just a waste of space as a character. Episode four doesn't do him any justice either because God fucking damn it, I have to talk about episode four first, don't I? Life is Strange 2 episode four is probably one of the worst episodes in the entire franchise. It starts off well with Sean waking up from a month long coma. We get introduced to a nice nurse character named Joey who helps Sean try to get used to only using one eye and teaches him how to clean his wound. Joey also sneaks in Sean's notebook where he finds a letter from Jacob saying that he has taken Daniel to Nevada where he's staying at a church called Haven Point. Sean sneaks out of the hospital, passing by Finn if he survived in the previous episode where he'll apologize and you can choose to accept the apology or not. After that, Sean will steal a car and take the long drive to the church. Sean is greeted by a gentleman outside of the church who welcomes Sean in. Sean starts watching the service from the balcony and sees that the church has taken Daniel in and sees him as some sort of prophet. Once the service is over, Sean will go downstairs to talk to Daniel, where the two finally reunite. But Daniel doesn't want to leave a child. The pastor of the church's name is Elizabeth Fisher, and she basically has Daniel wrapped around her little finger. 
She asks Daniel and Jacob's younger sister, named Sarah Lee, to leave the room so the two of them can talk. It's clearly obvious to Sean that Elizabeth just wants to use Daniel for her own personal gain. But when he goes to the room to grab Daniel, Elizabeth grabs Sean's arm, and when he lightly pushes her away, she very dramatically falls to the ground and just so happens to get a nosebleed, just as Daniel and Sarah Lee return. This, of course, encourages Daniel to not want to go with Sean. Then Sarah Lee's father comes in and drags Sean out, which is where we run into his mother. Sean's mother, Karen, takes Sean back to her hotel, where she talks about the reason why she had left them all those years ago, and hopes Sean can forgive her so they can find a way to get Daniel out of there. It seems that while Sean was in a coma, Jacob was able to get in touch with her, and she's been trying to get in contact with Daniel ever since. Sean eventually meets back up with Jacob, where he promises to help Sean if he can also help him get his sister out of the church. It seems Sarah Lee is very sick, but her parents and Elizabeth have been telling her to just pray the sickness away and she'll get better. Sean agrees to help, and when Jacob is able to sneak Sean back in, they're eventually able to break into Elizabeth's house to get Sarah Lee's health records. And I just want to say, they eventually get the health records where we find out she has ammonia, and they won't treat it because if God wanted to make her better, he would. But this bitch gets a yeast infection, but that's okay for her to get treated. Sorry that God couldn't keep the yeast away. Sorry, this uh, episode does things to me. Anyway, Jacob then opens up to you in this episode and talks about the main reason he ran away, which was because his parents and Elizabeth started to notice that Jacob likes boys, so they sent him away to a conversion camp. Jesus fucking Christ. Now, depending on the scenario, you can either get caught and be brought to Elizabeth and Daniel, or Sean's mother could help by setting the church on fire, which will give enough distraction for Sean to then go meet up with Elizabeth and Daniel. Hopefully, the clues you find in the office will convince Daniel that Elizabeth is a bad person. At one point, Daniel becomes angry and uses his powers, but he accidentally knocks over a candle, which causes the church to be set on fire. Now, depending on your relationship with Daniel, a couple of things can happen here. Daniel can kill Lisbeth. Sean can tell Daniel not to kill Lisbeth and just push her out of the way. Sean could shoot Lisbeth or shoot her when Daniel is about to kill her so he doesn't have to be the one to do it. Regardless on what you choose, the brothers will leave with their mother and meet up with Jacob and Sarah Lee and say their goodbyes. That's how episode four ends. All right. Where do I start? Look, I'm sure when Don't Nod was making the character of Elizabeth, they probably wanted to make such a hateful character, and my god, did they do a good job at that. I want you to know, it took so much strength in me to not either have Sean or Daniel enter. And speaking of Daniel, just... Why? I just can't stand that between episodes 3 and 4, what I feel like was every right option to being a caring and supportive brother to Daniel, and to be as transparent as possible, and to show the sacrifices that Sean had to keep making, to keep them safe. But for Daniel, none of that mattered. Everything they had been through, all those months, just meant absolutely nothing to him. Sean losing his eye and traveling all the way from California to Nevada to find him meant nothing. I get it. Okay? He's a kid. I get that this church has given him something that he probably hasn't had in a long, long time. But God, Daniel. That's your brother. The same brother who'd give up anything to make sure that you made it out alive. To make sure no one would touch you or hurt you. And this is how you treat him? Fuck, man. It sucks. Unlike the original Life is Strange, the second one has a total of four endings, which, depending on how you've treated Daniel and what Daniel has observed from you, is the result on what ending you can get. The brothers finally make it to the border, where there are cop cars waiting for them. Sean can make the decision to either surrender or storm through the cops. If Sean decides to storm through the cops, Daniel will use his power to push the cops out of the way with his powers, but decide he doesn't want to go and jumps out of the car while Sean drives to Puerto Lobos. Daniel will get arrested and eventually will be released into the care of his grandparents. 
Six years will pass and we'll see photos on a cork board of Daniel growing up and even a moment where a school bus almost crashed and he saved it without people noticing his powers. Daniel, being a teenager now, is seen wearing an ankle monitor while talking on the phone. Since the cops saw Daniel use his powers, it seems he's constantly being monitored now. Daniel's grandmother walks in and hands Daniel a letter from Sean in Puerto Lobos. Sean will also send photos of either himself with Finn or Cassidy, depending what you choose, or it could just be a picture of him by himself. He'll also send some sand in an envelope. Now, if Sean chooses to surrender, he'll be arrested, and Daniel will get to live with his grandparents. Some of the pictures are different here, like one of Daniel going to visit Sean in jail, Daniel graduating from high school, and working at a part-time job. He'll also have some art that Sean will send him, and one photo of Daniel getting ready for college. The next scene takes place 15 years after Sean is arrested, and it's Sean finally getting released from jail. And outside waiting is Daniel, Karen, and Lila. After that, it shows the brothers at the campground that they first went to, finally able to have a real camping trip. That night, as Daniel tells the story of his life, Sean breaks down and starts to cry, realizing what he had missed since he's been in prison, and realizing that everything that the two have been through together. Daniel now holding Sean like how Sean used to hold him. In the morning, the brothers hug and part ways. Sean, now finally free, gets to start his new life as a free man. But not without one last how. Now, depending on how Sean has treated Daniel throughout the game, when Sean tells him they're going to surrender, Daniel doesn't want to hear that and uses his powers to drive the car through the cops, which sadly will cause Sean to get shot in the neck and die. We once again see newspaper clippings and photos on a corkboard, where we see the death of Sean in a newspaper and a newspaper article in Spanish talking about a pickpocket. The last newspaper article we see is of a bank explosion where $100 million was stolen and another one where during a local gang raid, two people were killed. We then see Daniel, six years later after his brother's passing, with blonde hair and drawing in Sean's old notebook. Daniel walks up to a memorial area for Sean with a cross in the lighter his father gave him. Daniel rips out the pages of a book to see one lone wolf howling at the moon. Daniel then is surrounded by three men with weapons, looking to rob Daniel. But it's no use. Daniel uses his powers on them and causes the one with the gun to point it at himself. Daniel stares him down, but he walks away and releases the man from his grip. The last ending involves that the brothers decide to face the police and go to Mexico. Daniel will get out of the car and use his powers to take down the cops. Daniel returns to the car where he and Sean leave for Puerto Lobos. We then see the corkboard again, but this time it'll have drawings from Sean of local areas and people they've seen, the house their father always talked about, and a drawing of two wolf brothers. We also see the brothers have turned the house into a repair shop called Diaz Repair Shop. I know this ending sounds nice, but it turns out Sean and Daniel have turned to a life of crime, which we can see by the similar newspaper clippings we saw in Daniel's ending. While an older Daniel sits in a room looking through Sean's old journal, he sees his brother slowly walking backwards with his hands up and sees there's a man with a gun pointing it at Sean. Daniel walks in, pushing the men away, and starts choking the one with the gun. Daniel throws him, scaring off the three men. Later, the two boys are sitting outside drinking beers, finally having the freedom they fought so hard to have. Now, there's no true ending in Life is Strange 2. Just like how there's no true ending in the first Life is Strange, However, the game will tell which ending is a good moral or a bad moral by the prosthetic eye Sean is wearing. Good moral ending, his eye will be white. Bad moral ending, his eye will be black. Personally, even though I am not a big fan of it, the ending I tend to lean towards is Sean surrendering himself to the police and Daniel getting to live the normal life Sean always wanted for him. The reason I chose this ending, even though I don't like it that much, is because Sean, throughout the entire game, 
had to make sacrifices for something that wasn't his fault. He goes on this entire journey just to get caught in the end. But at least I know in this ending that Sean is alive. Daniel is safe. And though 16 years later, Sean gets out. He's finally given the chance to just let it out and gets to live life the way he finally wanted to. No longer on the run. No longer always having to check his back. And no longer having to worry about taking care of someone. It's just Sean. Finally. There is one important message that Life is Strange 2 tells you. As we get older, we run into people in our lives. Bad people. People who look trustworthy, but deep down have evil intentions. People who will knock you down, even if you try to get back up. People who will judge and hurt you for something that is completely out of your control. People who will hate you just for being you. But there are also people in the world who are good people. People you can trust. People you can trust your entire life with and protect you no matter what. People with good intentions. People who will see you knocked down and help you pick you back up. People who won't judge or hurt you. And people who will love you for being you. Life is Strange 2 teaches us that there are times where we might lose our faith in people. But it also teaches us how we can restore our faith in people as well. is why I can say this is why I like Life is Strange too. <laughs>